would do. That's really difficult. I don't hit this one. That's <laughs> well. You don't want me on the front row. Hit this one. My dad. <laughs> that lady right there, I'll tell you. That's the top of my range. All you have to do is echo her, but you knew that. <laughs> it's easy. It's fine. They can go probably share with you. And that's Dana. Michelle, I'm Jake. That's Brittany. Did you know Brittany? <laughs> This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And as always, we have so much to rejoice in on this Sunday, even more so than usual, because it's our second round of our World Communion Sunday, where we're doing our joint worship with our sisters and brothers at Shepherd Street Christian Church. So welcome, everyone. I have to tell you something that's kind of uh, funny and yet also kind of heartwarming at the same time. Um, this week, the uh, the vicar over at the Episcopal Church, whose name is, is Bill uh, Carlin, not related to George Carlin, because I asked him that too. His name is Bill Carlin, uh, and he came over on Wednesday, and he, not, he goes, I'm just being a nosy neighbor, and I said, okay, great, whatever. He goes, are you all okay? And I said, well, yeah, why? He said, well, Sunday you guys were closed. There wasn't one car over there. And they said, we, they thought COVID came and took us all out. 
So I told him about what we were doing, and he said, that is the neatest idea. So I just know that coming together for worship always makes God smile. So glad to have everyone here. Hey, glad to have our friends on Facebook Live that are joining us on our Facebook page as well as Shepherd Street Christian Church's page. So we, we got dueling cameras going on here. So um, glad to have that as well. And for those of you that are online, if you just want to say, hey, I'm here, so we have a record of your visit. But those of you that are here physically, if you can find the friendship pads, um, there's one on the end of every pew. Fill them out, pass them down so we have a record of your visit with us. And while you're doing that, um, I'm going to turn over to not Samantha. Oh, wait, wait, no, no, no. We've got, we've got birthday first. We've got birthday. I forgot. So our tradition is the first Sunday of the month, uh, we always celebrate everybody's birthday that month. And so this is our first Sunday here uh, for the month. So if you are an October birthday baby, we want to sing happy birthday to you. So if you could stand up, wave your hand if you're an October baby, and that way we can sing. Now I'll turn it over to Virginia. All right. Good morning. It is wonderful to see this church fuller. <laughs> Not full, but fuller. And we're so happy that you're all here. If you would open your bulletin to the insert inside, there are several announcements that we need to be reminded of. Today, after worship, Fellowship dinner will be held downstairs. So we did not expect anyone from Shepherd Street to bring any food, but some of you did and we thank you, but there's going to be plenty. So please, all of you, plan to stay downstairs so we can enjoy fellowship and get to know each other better. <clears throat> and I do not think that two times a year is enough for us to meet together. I would love for us to do this more often. And I talked with someone last week from your church, and they said, I'm going to be after that Milton. We need to do this more often. <laughs> and I don't know who that was, but, but if Milton has somebody on his uh, uh, good side, uh, they, that's the reason. Uh, also, some announcements you need to, to be aware of. <clears throat> On Thursday, our ladies group, DWF, will meet at 1 o'clock here at the church, and we will caravan out to Donna Richardson's house. Marty was scheduled to have this meeting, but she's not going to be able to do that, so plan to come, be at the church at 1 o'clock, and we will all go together to Donna's house. Uh, if you'll notice up here, we have boxes for Operation Christmas Child, and in our... In our uh, Word, I think you have all the things that people would like to put in the boxes. These go all over the world, and it's wonderful to see the boxes come in. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of boxes come in from the Chickasha area, and they are sent together with all the churches, all the organizations, and they go out to help children in need. So it's such a worthwhile thing. So as you leave today, if you'll pick up one or two boxes, fill those, that would be most appreciated. Um, it is time for our annual budget to be presented, and those need to be in to Reverend Michael by October 31st. So if you are a committee chair, please see Michael and see what you can do with your budget this year. The nominating committee will meet on Tuesday at 1 o'clock, I'm sorry, uh, at October 11th at 10 o'clock. And uh, if you get a phone call and you're asked to serve in this church, everybody's going to say, yes, right? Let's hear it. Yes. I didn't hear enough. Yes. Yes. That's the way, and we'll have no trouble. I'm on the nominating committee, and I heard you say that. <clears throat> um, let's see if there's anything else we, oh, one other thing. This is a time to share joys, 
And I'm going to ask if you have a joy that you want to share, you stand up. But before anybody else has a chance, I have a joy. I have a grandson, granddaughter, who live in Frisco, Texas. They have a three-year-old little boy. They have a 16-month-old little boy. And as of Monday, they have a little girl. And her name is Jillian Joe, and we're all thrilled to death to have a girl in the Ramsey family, because we don't do girls, unlike the Browns, who don't do as many boys. So anybody else have a joy that they would like to share? Naval Academy? Nuclear power. Well, oh. So he took the test to see how he did with doing a baby. And he was in the top 1% of the top 1%. Wow. wow. That's great. I'm here to say another Frisco family is here. <laughs> Yay. <clears throat> Anybody else have a joy they'd like to share? Virginia? Yes. Um, we spent this last weekend from Wednesday to Saturday. Oh, it's still the weekend. Um, anyway, camping at Romano's with four grandchildren, little grandchildren, and their parents were in and out, but you need to take all those grandkids you're talking about in a camper for four days because it makes you want to get outside and enjoy God's beautiful earth that he gave us. It was beautiful weather. It was a wonderful time, but we're very joyful that we're here now. Speaking of joys and grandbabies, uh, my, our newest grandbabies back in the back row. Yay! Yay. Get that, please show us because we'll need help. But also, I would like Reverend Dover and Pastor Bowens. You two guys, yeah. Nelson, come on. It is Minister Appreciation Week. Oh. Appreciation of these two gentlemen. Thank you. Expects us to use these gift cards on our wives. <laughs> <laughs> They're going to get it anyway. <laughs> okay. And now, if you will, we're going to pass the peace. And that means stand up, we're going to look around, and we're going to greet each other in Christian love.
And if you will remain standing, we'll do the call to worship, which you might find up on the screen or in your bulletin. Make a joyful noise to God, all the earth. Sing your praise to the glory of God's name. Jesus lifted me, singing glory, hallelujah. Gather to remember all that God has revealed. Come to discover what God is doing among us. Jesus And would you bow your heads with me as we pray? Our Father God, we come to you today with a grateful, thankful heart. We are so happy that we are joined together as Christians, as your children. We love each other and we know, dear God, that it makes you smile to see us worship together. We ask, dear God, that all those who could not be with us might be lifted up today with this service. And we know, dear God, that all good things come from you. Let us give thanks for that. We thank you for the rain, which we needed so badly. We thank you for all the blessings that you give us. And we ask, dear God, that we might look this week for ways that we might serve you. Amen. Amen. And you may be seated. <clears throat> and do we have any children in here that would like to come up for a children's moment? or? A pre-adult. If you're not an adult, younger than adult and want to come forward, I think we'll have a children's moment ready if y'all want to come up. <laughs> Chapter of 
chapter in the book of John, chapter, I believe it's 8, verse 12, Jesus says, now we're going to put a little more authority for Jesus than we do for Alex Dumbledore. <laughs> Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Anyone who follows me will come out of the darkness. Just like when you turn on the light, just like when you turn on the light in a dark room, we can look at Jesus and follow him, and we can become the light for others. Now, that's kind of, I kind of rephrased what Jesus said, that I am the light of the world, and it became a little bit of Becky's gospel, because I think children and young adults can be the light of the world. I think you and you and you and you and you and you and you already have that light of Jesus inside you, and any time you go in darkness, where maybe somebody's in a bad mood or somebody has done something that may not be quite right, you guys can be the example and shine Jesus' light before you so that others will be able to do the same thing. And then you'll be following what Jesus said. Now, who knows what this is? Okay, good. That's a pretty easy, pretty easy question, right? A flashlight. How do you turn it on? You going to show us your mind? Okay. There we go. Is it shining? I don't want to put anybody's eyes on. It's pretty bright, isn't it? You can see it on the floor. But if I just waved it around like this before I push the button, it's not going to do anything, is it? I have to do something to this flashlight. I have to push the button before it's going to come on and shine. So, what are some things we might have to do before we can show people that we can shine the light of Jesus? What is something, what is something that we might do to teach ourselves how to do what to drink? Read the Bible. That's an excellent thing to do. How about, how do we treat our friends? Be caring and treat them nicely. Those are all things that we have to work on and do before people can see the light of Jesus in us. Now, I have a light for each one of you, and I'm going to, yay, and then I'm just going to let you guys each, or just so we don't have to. Okay, I'll just pass it on down, pass it on down. There we go. I want everybody to get one. Tell me when everybody has one. Can you keep passing them for me? There we go. Does everybody have one now? Okay. We can switch uh, Now, go ahead and turn your lights on. Shine them all around. Shine them all around.
they can learn from them, and then they can share your example with their friends and others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You guys have a great Michael, before you begin, I know another joy and nobody jumped up and said, we are here with our baby. Uh, Kathy, why don't you introduce your baby, your grandbaby to the congregation? Thank you, Virginia, for that. And um, also, um, since we did some joys again, let's do, to focus on our concerns. And if you look in your bulletins uh, where it says announcements, right underneath that's where we start our concern list. And as always, you can take a look at those that uh, are continuing to battle cancer, and those that continue to uh, ongo some medical concerns as well. Um, we continue to lift them all up in our prayers. Crystal continues to go through testing and trying to get everything balanced in, in her system. And, oh, Marty's here. We're praying for Bud, who is, when's he going to start his treatment? He has another surgery on Thursday. Okay, his bladder cancer surgery will be Thursday. So we're continuing to pray for Bud. And Marty, we're, we're praying for you. <laughs> so then we continue to pray for uh, Gary and Sarah Drake's grandson, Perry, who is going to be undergoing ear reconstruction surgery, maybe over the Christmas break. Uh, and then Mox, we're uh, looking at different treatments for him. He's four years old and has hip dysplasia. Well, at least they thought so. It turns out that the little ball part of the ball joint is um, not getting any blood flow to it. So the bone is dying. And so they're looking at what they can do. Uh, to sustain him until he's old enough, uh, like in his teenage years, to have the surgery that he needs to have. Um, many of you all remember Herb Terry. He was our custodian here uh, twice um, in the years of this church. Uh, he is now in his 90s? No, his late 80s. Um, he lives just a few blocks over here from the church. Um, he said he was roasting or smoking a roast or something, and thought, well, that doesn't smell like cooking meat. It smells like something else. He opened the back door where the roaster was, and it was on fire and uh, engulfed uh, half of his house. So uh, he came by and asked for us to have prayer. He does have home insurance, so that's good. But um, has anybody ever survived a house burning? It's not good. And um, all this stuff that didn't burn smells like it did. So um, they're having to restart. So if you can pray for them. Um, also, uh, Jan Hansen, we're lifting up you and your family and the passing of your uncle so, um, and the whole family. Uh, are there any other joys or concerns that we need to lift up at this time? Uh, any from Shepherd Street that we want to lift up? Everyone's silent. Wow. <laughs> well, you know, that's a blessing in itself. That's a blessing in itself that we don't have those concerns running around. So let's keep those uh, and the ones that were mentioned, not mentioned, the ones that were printed or not printed, the ones that are spoken out loud at home, who those that are watching. Let's hold all of them in our thoughts and prayers as we go before our Lord in this time of prayer. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh God, we feel your presence here where you have promised in your word that where two or more have gathered. Oh, Lord, we're thankful that you put that bar really low. But you did it on purpose to tell us that we need one another. We need our sisters and brothers. We need to learn to lean on them and share with them what's going on in our lives. 
Sometimes we want to share the good news so easily, which is great. But other times we need to share the things that we're struggling with so that the others around us can lift us up and give us a hug or hold us when we don't have enough strength to hold ourselves. And following suit to that, God, we list those that are struggling right now. Those that we heard by ear and those that we know live in our hearts where you live. Hear our prayers, God. But also, God, help us. Help us to know when we need to open ourselves up to receive humbly the gifts of love from our sisters and brothers when we share our concerns as well. So as we lift up concerns, we know, God, that someone is lifting us up as well. We bring all these to you, God, because we trust and know that you are God, not of the distant, not of the past, but the here and now who lives with us, among us. We bring them to you, O living God, because we know that you hear our thoughts and our prayers, but you also promise to never leave our side. So may we feel your strength when we need it, and may we feel your joy when we're ready to celebrate and to lift all up here and now across this entire globe. Hear our prayer, for we offer them in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. I invite our deacons to make their way to the back of the sanctuary as we prepare to receive our offering this morning. As you all came in to worship today, hopefully you may have seen uh, by the bulletins uh, this little flyer and a little envelope, um, and we have some that are taped up around the sanctuary. Um, since we're celebrating World Communion Sunday in uh, two parts, uh, I thought it'd be appropriate because this is an special, an important special offering. Uh, it's one of the offerings we take up uh, once or, or four times a year of our special offering that goes beyond just Chickasha. It goes on to the Christian Church Disciples of Christ in the general sense. Um, this is our uh, reconciliation offering that happens in October. Uh, where we are helping to fund both uh, monetarily as well as spiritual support the efforts of our denomination to reconcile one another back together. And uh, boy, how happy they would be that Shepherd Street and, Deci and First Christian are joint worshiping as we're talking about this. Uh, because, because of the funds that we received from this, uh, there's education made possible for people to realize that God made us and God didn't care about how we look on the outside. It's how we act on the inside. So uh, it's an opportunity for us to give to the special offering. If you didn't see when we picked one up as you came in, it's not too late to grab one on the way out and just drop it in the offering plates. So It'll be up on the communion table. Uh, just another way where we can try our best to be as God has called us to do uh, as members of the Christian church as well as Christ and of the Christian body. Think of these things and others as the plates are passed.
please rise. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures Praise Him all the Praise all Son and Holy Indeed, gracious God, we are a thankful people that you give us blessings that we can use to bless others. And as we gather the offering here this morning, may it be joined with all of your churches across the street, across the city, across the globe itself, to make a difference in this world for your glory. In Christ's name, amen. amen. You may be seated.
And now, if you are able, would you stand out of respect for the reading of God's word? Today, our reading comes from John, the 21st chapter, verses 15 through 19. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of God, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. A second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know I love everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt and to go wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where, do you, where you do not wish to go. He said this to indicate the kind of death by which he would glorify God. After this, he said to him, follow me. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. <clears throat> Let us pray. Eternal God, our Father, we thank you that you've allowed us to gather in this space. Lord, we don't take for granted that the last time we gathered could have been our last. But Father God, we submit our will unto yours and ask that you speak. Speak to us, Lord God, in such a way that we leave this place better than how we came. Stronger, more corrected, more inspired, to be and do all that you've purposed us to, Lord. I pray that there'll be less of me and more of you. Decrease me and hide me behind your cross, Father, that your word might speak in such a way that hearts will be lifted, souls will be inspired, lives will be corrected, and our growth will be challenged. And it's in Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen. amen. Well, good morning, everybody. This morning, for the time that is out, I just want to say that I count it a blessing to be here. Um, I often look forward to this time that we are able to gather and demonstrate what church looks like and what church is. Amen? Amen. But with the time that is ours, I want to talk to you from the subject of recovery. Somebody look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, neighbor. it's time to recover. It's long been said that we serve a God who specializes in second chances. But the reality of it is, is that many of us are not willing to give ourselves a second chance. When we consider all of our regrets, all of our shortcomings, all of our false failures and flaws, it becomes nearly impossible to embrace the gift that God has already offered to each and every one of us. So instead of seizing a second chance, or in some of our cases, a 15th, 18th, 137th chance, we remain captive in a place of pain, struggling to embrace the love that we so desperately need. I had a conversation with someone not that long, long ago, and they asked, how can God love me the way you say God loves me? How can God really use my life after all the things that I've done? And I decided to share a word that has encouraged me in seasons of failure and seasons of really, to be honest, depression. And I said that God could be creator without you. God could be sustainer without you. But without you, God could not be redeemer. There's something in your flaws that God can use creatively to tap into in order to accomplish something through you that God could do through no one else. And God is not just a creator. God is not just a sustainer, but God is also a redeemer. God is the master craftsman who takes the time to restore which everyone else has given up on or has written off. 
And even when we have given up on ourselves, it is our task to remind ourselves that the most beautiful aspect of God is God's ability to redeem our flawed and fickle humanity. Amen. That God lifts us out of our disappointments and our regrets and in our sorrows and places us on the pathway to recovery. Somebody say recovery. recovery. Does anyone know what it's like to be tired of yourself? You've been stuck in a place of disappointment and regrets, yet the word of the Lord to you is that God wants to make you perfect because a redeemed person is more valuable than a, perf than a perfect person any day. And if you will just embrace the beauty of God's restorative power, you might find out that your best days are still in front of you that your future is still worth smiling about. You might be weeping right now, but joy is just over the horizon that recovery is on the way. Somebody say amen. amen. If you can just embrace the fact that our God is a redeemer, and that's what we find out in this 21st chapter of John's gospel, that as we sit in, in the very back of this mystical book, we find out how to recover from our disappointments and regrets and to walk in the joy of being redeemed. In this scene, we find the resurrected Jesus reunited with his failed and fickled and flawed disciples. This band of 11 disciples who were with Jesus in the beginning but couldn't stick with him in the end. When the times got tough and the heat got hot, one by one, these disciples trickled away. And before you know it, Jesus was on the cross and lying in a grave without any of these disciples standing by. Now, we could judge them, or we could instead choose to see ourselves in them. The disciples gave up on Jesus, like many of us at one point or another has given up on a dead situation in our lives. Yet God finds a way to conquer those dead situations and breathe new life into the very thing we abandoned. And now in this post-resurrection moment, the disciples have to get reacquainted with the Jesus they gave up on. And they have to do all of that while suffering from the pain that comes from knowing they failed their friend. We have here in our text some disciples who are hurting and are standing in the need of recovery. Somebody say recovery. But the good news is this morning is that even though they failed Jesus, Jesus doesn't hold any frustration against them. Isn't it funny that God never treats us the way that we treat each other? I don't know about you, but that's why I shout. That's why I get happy. That's why I get excited because, isn't, because God isn't bitter like some of us. God doesn't hold grudges like some of your family members do. God isn't manipulative and petty like some of your coworkers are. God isn't self-absorbed and unforgiving. God isn't high-strung. God specializes in two characteristics that we rarely get to see in other people. And those characteristics are grace and love. And I thank God today because when God could have met me with a whole lot of atti attitudes, grace and love stepped in and made a way out of no way in my life. In the midst of their regret and shame, Jesus walks back into their lives and says, join me for breakfast. I don't know about you, but breakfast is my most favorite meal of the day. Amen. What a beautiful scene, hurting disciples eating breakfast with a healed Savior. Disciples who abandoned Jesus at the cross now somehow get the grace to share a meal with him. It reminds us that our failures do not have the final say in our lives. The resurrection can override all of our regrets and disappointments. That you can be hurting from your mistakes and still be blessed to have the opportunity to sit and eat in the presence of a healed Savior. I'm hurting, but my opportunity for healing is standing right in front of me. My heart is broken, but I'm still in the presence of a heart fixer. My mind is stressed out with anxiety and fear, but I'm standing in the presence of a mind regulator. Disappointments have driven me to a place of despair, but I'm sitting with the one who has the power to deliver us up out of our depression. It's good news to know that my hurts don't change God's position. My failures don't force me out of his presence. I can still be in a season of recovery, but I'm already redeemed. 
I'm a hurting disciple, but I'm standing in the presence of a healed Savior. I don't know about you, but that's some good news for people like me. And it's really good news for a brother by the name of Simon Peter. Because in this moment, Peter is living with the weight of regret and disappointment that comes in knowing I gave up too soon. Peter is sitting in a place of pain that many of us are familiar with. Peter was given the rare opportunity to be Jesus' right-hand man. And when this struggling fisherman meets Jesus, his life is radically transformed. So much so that Peter leaves behind his career, his home, and his family to follow a carpenter from Galilee. For three years, Peter has a front row seat to all of the divine teaching into all of the inspiring mi miracles. Peter finds out what it's like to walk on water and even get to spend some time on the Mount Transfiguration, hanging out with Moses and Elijah. Peter is one of Jesus' favorite people. Jesus places a lot of hope and confidence in Peter, but at times, Peter struggles to live up to the potential that has been spoken into his life. People like Peter, people often like Peter because he was the, the disciple that showed the most humanity. Peter was that cussing and, and, and fighting disciple. But on a deeper level, there's something more insightful that all of us share with Peter, and that is too often missed. Peter's real problem has nothing to do with his eccentric personality. Peter's real problem is that he struggles with regret and disappointment and doubt. Here is a man who proudly proclaimed, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. But just a few chapters later, he would deny him even knowing, he would deny even knowing Jesus three times. And now here in chapter 21, Peter is carrying the weight of all of that regret on his shoulders. All of his confidence and self-esteem has been shattered and he has to wonder, why would God make a mess like me? Haven't we all been there? There was a season when God stepped into our lives and took us from ordinary living to abundant life. We saw God moving in our lives and enlarging our faith and stretching the, the, the circumference of our dreams. We were waking up to witness the impossible every morning, but as soon as we hit one bump in the road, we not only gave up on ourselves, but we also gave up on our dreams, and we sometimes gave up on God as well. If we can be honest today, there are many of us in this space who can admit that we're struggling to recover. Struggling to recover from shattered expectations. Struggling to recover from the heartbreak of disaster. We're sitting on the edge of our beds at three in the morning, our, our feet dangling into eternity, asking God, what would, you want, what would you want to do with me after this? After I failed, what can you do in my life? In the middle of this heart-wrenching regret, Jesus offers Peter and all of us a peculiar way, pathway to recovery. Jesus sits with Peter after breakfast and asks him one question three times. One question three times. Simon, do you love me? Simon, do you love me? Simon, do you love me? It hurts to hear, but he has to ask the question three times. Simon, do you love me? The question is raised three times because the level of love has to be equal to the level of disappointment. The same rule applies in every relationship. The, the level of love always has to be equal to or greater than the level of disappointment. In order for a relationship to survive, the level of love has to be equal to or greater than the disappointment. But please understand that what was being corrected here is not Jesus' disappointment in Peter. Jesus is not the one disappointed in Peter because Jesus predicted Peter's disobedience and betrayal three times before, he even, before it even took place. Jesus said in John chapter 13, look, Peter, before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. So Jesus couldn't have been disappointed because he already knew what was going to happen. The disappointment is not sitting in the heart of Jesus. The disappointment is sitting in the heart of Peter. And Peter is the one who has to grapple with the pain and despair that comes with knowing you disappointed the person you love, the person you respect, the person that you admire, the person that you gave up everything for to follow. Yeah. Hear me, church. God is not the one who's disappointed in you. God saw your mistakes coming. 
The reason God is questioning you like Jesus questions Peter is because God recognizes that the disappointment is still sitting in your heart. And God wants you to know, God wants to know, are you finally ready to move past what happened? So sometimes God has to make you question your motives, question your values, question your integrity. Because until you deal with what's going on in your heart, you will never have the faith to move forward and seize your future. Simon, do you love me? This audacious question three times because, because the level of love has to be equal to or greater than the disappointment. See, that's why a mother's love is supreme because no matter what you do, that mother's love is always greater than or equal to your mistakes. So even when, when, when we are in our foolish, prodigal moments in life and we disappointed our parents, their love was always there to cover because their love always exceeded the level of our disappointment to them. So when you have disappointed yourselves, you need people who will speak life and help you find a way to love yourself over again. You don't need a crowd of people pointing their fingers at you. You need a beloved faith community who can love you back to health. As you walk this road to recovery, you've got to find people who will help rebuild your love for your future, your love for your gifts, your love for life itself. And that's why the church is so important. Because although we're imperfect, although we're flawed, we are still this beloved community that comes together to love and build each other back up after, after being in the world for so long and being torn down. You can enter into the presence of your faith community and be restored again. The question is not, does God love you enough to redeem your life? The question is, do you love God enough to chase after a new life? after a new opportunity, after the doors that God's already opened for you, or would you rather sit stagnant in a place of your despair and your dysfunction? Do you love me, God asks. Can you love the idea of a God who is so radically invested in your future that he will instantaneously forgive your past? Even though you are disappointed in yourself, you've got to hold on to the fact that God is not disappointed in you. I know you expect that this thing to go another way, but do God says, do you love me enough to believe that things can get better even after your heart's been broken? Do you love me enough to wait through the delay? Peter's problem is he gave up on his situation too early. The tomb was only closed for three days. God had a much different plan, a different timetable than Peter. And we are recovering from our, and when we are recovering from our disappointments, we have to remember that our expectations and our time frame are two very different things. Are you disappointed because God didn't do it? Or are you disappointed because God didn't do it when you scheduled it to be done? Did your dream really die? Or did, the, or did your deadline just pass? Church, God rarely fails to meet, our ex, to meet or exceed our expectations. But God always fails to meet our timelines. So you pray for something. You believe that thing that you prayed for was coming by next Thursday at noon. And when it didn't show up, you assumed that God didn't hear your prayer. So you said it a little bit louder for the folk in the back. God heard your prayer. God just didn't respect your timeline. The best blessing in your life won't come via Amazon Prime next day delivery. And you've got to be able to keep high expectations even after your time frame has passed. Do you love God enough to keep on believing? Do you love God enough to keep waiting? Do you love God enough to keep fasting and praying even after your heart's been broken? Do you love God enough even after your dream has died in your lap? Even after your pillow has been saturated and soaked with tears in the midnight hour? God is saying, Peter, do you love me enough to still believe that you can recover? Somebody say recovery. Can you believe that what you're looking for is still on the way? God says, I want to loose you from your arbitrary time frame so that you can resurrect your expectations. In order to place us on the right road of recovery, God brings us, to, brings us up and out of our disappointments and our regrets. Secondly, God also raises us out of our state of denial. Notice 
that now this 21st chapter of John's gospel begins by informing us that several of the disciples were together. And Simon Peter said to them in verse 3, I'm going fishing. This seems like, like an innocent and insignificant comment, but before Peter met Jesus, he was a fisherman. But Peter, you just spent three years hanging out with Jesus. They were performing miracles, helping the poor, changing lives. And yet after this amazing experience, Peter wants to go back to being a fisherman. And it points to a mistake that many of us make after we go through an extraordinary experience that doesn't turn out the way, that doesn't turn out the way that we expect it to. We try to retreat back into what was comfortable. We try to retreat back into what our ordinary life was that we used to know, what we used to do. We become like a toddler clinging onto a security blanket because it is familiar, it's comfortable, and it's sometimes settling for us. How, after, how often after we've said yes to God and we hit a bump in the road, we're ready to go back to where we were before because it's familiar, it's comfortable. Listen, why retreat back into an ordinary life that we used to know? Because the reality is your life will never be the same again after you've experienced God. You will never be able to revert back to a pre-hurt chapter of your life. You can try to go back being a fisherman, but all you'll end up doing is sinking further and further into your regrets. You can't escape the pain of what happened by living as if it never happened. That's called living in denial. And if you want to recover, you have to embrace the fact that you will never be the same person you were again. Once you've experienced the radical, life-changing, transforming love of God, you can never go back to being a square peg trying to fit into a circle. It won't fit. It won't be comfortable. You'll go back to those friends in low places, and you'll find out that those friendships aren't the same. You'll try to go back to the bar that used to comfort you when things didn't go right, and the whiskey just doesn't have the same chilling power that it used to. Because I believe once you experience the love and the radical transform transforming love of God, your life will never and can never be the same. If you want to recover, you have to embrace the fact that you'll never be the same person again. God brought you up and out of your comfort zone for a reason. Then God allows you to go through an experience that may have hurt you or helped you, depending how you want to look at it. And it probably did a little bit of both, honestly. But know this experience changed you. And whether you like it or not, you can't go back to the life you had prior to this experience. You have grown and you've developed and you now see the world differently because of what you've been through. You might be hurting because of what you've been through, but the only way to recover is to embrace the fact that I am stronger, I am wiser, and I am better than I was before. Because I was refined in the fire. And I refuse to deny the reality of what I've been through. Peter, for three years, walked with Jesus. He had personal access to the Son of God, and somehow, after all of that, Peter wants to go back to the ordinary life of being a fisherman. Just because things didn't work out the way you planned. Hear me today, somebody. Don't allow the embarrassment of your failures to drive you back into a meaningless and mundane living. Don't allow what other people might be thinking or even have the gall to say about you force you into a season of denial when you don't embrace the reality of who you really are. You've got to learn to love every part of what has shaped you. Every experience, every mistake, every, every characteristic, every inch of your skin and fiber of your being and personality, you've got to love everything that has shaped you and when people try to reduce you down to what you used to be and what you've done, you have to stand up and declare that I will not deny myself the opportunity to walk in the authenticity of an almighty redeeming God. You've got to embrace yourself and not let the embarrassment and the shame of what happened keep you from reaching for better. Because life will either make you better or bitter. I know how it happens when we reach for the extraordinary and sometimes we fail. And because we are more concerned with our reputation than God's calling, we stop trying. Because I tried and, and, and it didn't turn out the way it was, I'm just going to go back and sit on my blessed assurance. But God never told you three strikes and you're out. 
That might be good, that might be a good baseball rule, but it's a terrible way to live your life. We don't serve a God who gives up on us after three strikes. In fact, even in baseball, a player who strikes out has to go sit on the bench in the dugout, but the bench is a temporary seat because after a few short innings, they've got to get back up and they have to have the courage to swing again. And the question that I have for you, Shepherd Street, the question I have for you today, First Christian, is are you going to decide to make the bench your permanent resting place? Are you trying to make the dugout your home? God is saying it's time to get back up and to keep on swinging, keep on trying, keep on serving, keep on growing, keep on maturing, keep on rising your level of faith, keep on your rising and increasing your level of trust because God says, I still got another opportunity for you. Keep walking in the calling that is your life. As you refuse to revert back to your old life, keep walking in the new life that God has given to you, and you will discover you're already on the road of recovery. The word of God for the people of God. All praises be to God. Woo, that was beautiful. He's on fire today, wasn't he? Woo. As we prepare to receive our Holy Communion, uh, which everyone is invited to be a part of, uh, I want to share with you something I'd heard someone shared about uh, wisdom from a grandma. We're always smart if we listen to our grandmas, right? Absolutely. Grandmas are filled with wisdom. He said he walked in the kitchen and grandma had three pots boiling of water. And in one, she had to put an egg in there. And then the second one, she had put a, a potato for dinner. But in the third one, she said, I want you to look at those pots. I want you to look at that. The third one didn't have anything in it yet. And she said, now watch, this egg is all squishy inside. But you put it in that hot water and it turns hard. And she said, now this potato is hard, but then when you put it in that hot water after a while, it'll soften up. So just exactly what you were talking about, Milton. Because she said, what part of it is, is if you let the world be the hot water for you, you're either going to come out hard or you're going to come out soft. But she said, now watch this. And she put coffee in the third one. And in the boiling water and the coffee mixed together, and it made a sweet aroma. And she said, now you see, look, they're working together to create something new. And that coffee is making a difference in the water, not the water making a difference in the coffee. And she said, that's exactly how you're supposed to live your life. Because you see, when we come to the communion table, when we come to communion, we're not letting the world make us hard, and we're not making the world let us soft. We are making a difference in the world, and we're calling everybody to come to the table and partake and get them off of those benches and out of the dugouts and say, get back in here because you know what? The world might make you hard and might make you soft, but God makes you sweet. Amen. Amen. So all believers are invited to come to the table. Amen. Crystal will lead us in our song. Let's sing together, I Come With Joy. You can find it on page 420 in your hymn book, or you can find it on the screen. We're singing verses 1, 2, and 5. I come with joy, a child of God, forgiven, loved, and free. The life of Jesus to recall, in love lay down for me. In love lay down for me. I come with Christians far and near to find us all our of love in Christ communion bread in Christ communion bread to gather met to gather bound by all that God has done we'll go with joy to give the world the love that makes us one the love that makes us one.
It was on that night when our Lord and Savior was gathered with the disciples at that first Last Supper that he took the bread from the table. He lifted it toward heaven to give thanks. But this time he said, this is not ordinary bread, for this is my body that I give unto you. Eat of it in remembrance of me. In like manner, he took some wine and poured it out and said, this is no longer ordinary wine, for this is my blood shed for you so that you can know what true forgiveness is all about, so that we can form another covenant, a covenant based on love. Drink of this in remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of the bread and we drink of the cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Let us pray. Gracious Spirit of God, we thank you for your church founded on your holy word that challenges us to do more than sing and pray, but go out and work as though the very answer to our prayers depended on us and not on you. Help us to realize that humanity was created to shine like the stars and live on through all eternity. Keep us in perfect peace to walk together, pray together, sing together, and live together until that day when all of God's children will rejoice in one common bond. We remember that all was done for us, the cross, the tomb, the resurrection, and the ascension. Dying, you destroyed our death. Rising, you restored our life. Send your Holy Spirit on us and on this gift of bread that it may be to us the body of your Christ. Grant that we may be a people of hope, justice, and love. Giver of life, draw us together in the body of Christ, through Christ and with Christ and in Christ, by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. God of light and love, we have found your truth in Jesus Christ and it has set us free. As we bless this cup in remembrance of Christ's blood poured out for us on Calvary's cross, enlighten us by your spirit this morning. In blessing and drinking this cup here this morning, we are mindful and grateful of your sacrifice. As we are being renewed by your spirit today, fill us with gratitude and praise, we pray, amen. Amen. The gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God.
Let us pray. O oh God, who brings us all together, who invites us to the table of remembrance and of fellowship, we're thankful that you have invited us today. But God, we are mindful that as we gather here, we know that some of our church members are physically unable to attend. Bless the elders as they extend the table of fellowship and remembrance to our homebound. So that way, God, we may all break bread and drink cup together. We may all remember and, and, uh, and claim the love that you have given to us through your son, that you sent to be born among us, to live among us, to walk with us, and to teach us how to live life itself. The very least we could do is to offer back the prayer he taught us so long ago. So as we blend our voices together, may your ears find it pleasing as we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our sins, as we forgive those who sinned against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. What a wonderful, blessed morning it has been to be together and to worship, and uh, especially those of us that are here together on this Sunday morning, as well as uh, those that are joining us by watching the recordings later, as well as watching it live. We're so glad to have everyone here, and what a blessing it is that we're here. Visitors, we're glad to have had you with us, as well as the membership that is here, but we invite everyone to go downstairs immediately after the service, because you could probably smell it. There's some good food cooking down there. You know, when they design churches, they never ask pastors uh, what, how we would design a church. For one, I'd always make it where we can reach the lights, because changing the light bulbs in the sanctuary are hard. And the other one is, I would never put a fellowship hall near a sanctuary, because when they do a fellowship dinner, it's hard to focus, isn't it? I mean, that's just, woo. Absolutely. So, uh, matter of fact, I believe, Paul, at your church uh, there in Ponca, didn't you all have the same problem with the kitchen? It was right off of the sanctuary, wasn't it? And you ate in the sanctuary. Oh, so there you go. So, but, so there's some good food down there waiting for us. So matter of fact, if you all don't mind, let's go ahead and have a blessing of the food so you don't have to wait on us to go down there. You all can get started as soon as you all get down there. So let's bow our heads. And gracious God, we're thankful for the provisions of which you give to us to live the life that you have blessed us with. We are thankful, God, for the food, the hands that prepared it, and the blessings we receive from it to physically sustain us as your, uh, as your love sustains our souls, for it's in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Okay, don't forget uh, that this Wednesday, this is fall break. It's hard to believe the school year is already to fall break. But uh, we're not going to have Bible study, we're not going to have youth group, and we're not going to have choir for fall break uh, uh, this Wednesday. But on Wednesday, don't forget, is First Christian Church Soup Kitchen Day. So if you want to help out um, Jan and Carolyn, and Char see Jan's already downstairs, isn't she? She already went down there. So find Jan if you want to help, and Carolyn, they could use your help for that as well. Uh, and uh, Milton, do you have any announcements that Sherbert Street needs to know? Yes, I do. I'm not as, as giving as Michael is. We will have Bible study and youth group <laughs> on Wednesday. Oh, I feel bad now. <laughs> no, you're good. <laughs> um, also, um, if I can meet with those that have vol volunteered to help out with, the, with our drive-in movie night that will be taking place on Saturday at 6.30, if you would please meet me at the church on Wednesday about 6.30, um, we just need to go over a few things. Um, I want to thank um, all of those that are vol volunteered and those that will be, be voluntold shortly <laughs> that you'll be helping. But, but the drive-in movie is open to the entire community. It'll be a family-friendly movie. You'll just pull up in front of the, in front of the church, and then we will have uh, a good time having movie, um, popcorn, snow cones, hot dogs, oh. so um, join us for that. We want to do it before it starts getting cold outside, so uh, youth, you'll meet at 7. Any of the vol volunteers or any youth that want to help volunteer or help with any of this stuff, just try to meet me at the church at 6.30. Amen? Amen. Great. 
Great. So as oh, we oh, go ahead, another one. Monday, tomorrow, tomorrow, today Sunday, Monday. Uh, we, if you can, please join us in celebrating Sister Natalie's pinning at a Canadian oh, Valley. That's right. She will um, be getting her pin as a nurse, and so we want to go and celebrate with her um, as part of her church family. Amen. So it'd be at, at Canadian Valley, and some someone will through the Remind app send the time of it because I don't remember what time. 6.30, thank you, Sister Anita. 6.30 <laughs> at CV Tech. So please join us in celebrating with Sister Natalie. Great. Nothing else. That's great. Okay, now as we leave from this place, though, uh, we do so by singing. So I'm going to turn it over to our closing song led by Crystal. <laughs> 